Has anyone seen John? He told me he'd uh, meet me here for a race. Uh, he seemed to be taking it pretty seriously. Uh, he was training for it a lot. And uh, any, Anyone see him at all? No? Is he over there? happening just wanted to look good for are those race. dress shoes <laughs> you know they're comfortable are you racing in dress shoes <laughs> is that a backpack yeah. Wait, here, let me see that what's going on what's going on in this back what just a what the what explorations in economics are we doing yeah. homework <laughs> <laughs> just trying to get stronger you know I mean, I appreciate the commitment to the best subject area, but still, like, <laughs> come on. I thought we were racing, man. Well, yeah, I came with what I thought was uh, yeah, being prepared, so. Yeah, I just, oh, here, man, okay. Here, sit down, sit down, everybody sit down. Have a seat, have a seat. Okay, man, here. Okay. So if you didn't know, when you're racing, you gotta be prepared. Okay, you gotta put on the right shoes, right? You gotta put on the right pants. <laughs> You're not gonna get far in that, man. I'm just gonna smoke you. Like I'm always gonna smoke yeah, it you. It doesn't like really it's matter. Yeah, it's gonna get a little hot you know. in these pants too. <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, I, I'm, Maybe, I'm pretty confident. Yeah, I'm giving, pretty confident. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just giving you a head start, you know. Yeah, I mean, like you can give me a head start if you want. Either way, you're gonna be two miles behind me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you got to be prepared, man. You got to be prepared for the race. Okay. Right? Can you tell me how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like I need a little bit of teaching here, John. <laughs> you got to be prepared. You got to push for every single step, right? You can't just show up on day one in your dress shoes. <laughs> you got to be prepared. You got to train ahead of time. You got to hydrate. You got to dress properly. And then you got to race and keep racing and keep pressing all the way to the finish line. You can't give up. Yeah, that's kind of like being a Christian. And being a Christian is hard work, but when you get to heaven, it's all worth the effort. <laughs> it's exactly like that. It's exactly right like that. In fact, Scripture often refers to being a Christian as running a race. And the more you think about it, like the more appropriate that probably is, right? Because racing, running, is really hard work. It is, right? Yeah. It's really, really hard work. You need to keep your eyes on the prize, right? You can't take any shortcuts and break the rules, yep. right? You need to be prepared and drop anything that's holding you back. And it's the same exact thing when you're being a Christian. Yeah, we, we must start the race. And in order to do that, you need to drop all the weights that are holding you back, like that backpack with all those books in it. Well, you, have one, you have one water bottle in here. I'll give you that, man. You have a water bottle. Okay, that's something. <laughs> a little prepared, at least. In Hebrews 12, uh, verse 11, 
it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So the cloud of witnesses here are the heroes of faith. And we did a whole great series on that last year uh, that included, you know, Gideon and Jacob and Abraham. Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a great series. And th those heroes can inspire us to run a race. They can support us. And, you know, God obviously supports us. But uh, and sometimes in the in the race of life, you know, we might waste time throughout our lives with with different activities. And we might ask the wrong questions like, is this a sin Versus, is this something that is getting in the way of me running that race? And so, you know, instead of asking what's wrong with watching this movie, what's wrong with, you know, watching TikTok or Instagram for a few hours. Or days or weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we need to be asking, is this a weight that's holding me back? Does this help me run the race with Jesus? And... There's ways to limit your screen time. Uh, that, did you, you just know, do that? I did. Yeah. I did just do that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's pretty tough, actually. I, I'm, I found myself hitting the ignore button and adding a few extra yeah. minutes. Oh. <laughs> Does it not count if you do that? It's st I'm it's, still achieving less right, time, right, but yeah. I'm cheating a little bit. Yeah, the effort counts yeah, a little bit. It does. Right, yeah. it's, it's, it's the right, you know, right. Right. priorities. Right, yeah. Your priorities <laughs> in the right spot. Yeah. And uh, if you're running towards Jesus, though, you're growing in a relationship with him. Right. And then you start exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit. And those are, those are joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And above all, you'll have less shame and sin entangling you once you do that. You know? And you'll feel free. You'll feel lighter. You'll break chains, you, uh, you'll feel joyful, and you'll be a light to others around you. And I'm going to need a few volunteers here, uh, maybe some brothers. Do we have any brothers in the house? Thomas? Thomas and Johnny? Where's Johnny at? Is Johnny around? Oh, okay. We'll, we'll take another volunteer. I saw, yeah, you raise your hand. You want to come up? Yeah. So we need two fishermen over here. You want the fishing pole? And so Simon Peter and Andrew, his brother in the Bible, were fishing along the Sea of Galilee. And, you know, they, that was their job. That was their occupation. And, and Jesus said, follow you, and I will make you fishers of men. And so he gave them a new purpose in their life. And so immediately when he said that, they dropped their fishing pole and tackle box in this situation, or as the Bible says, their nets. And then they followed him. Hey, thank you. You, you guys can be seated. <laughs> now, fishing wasn't a sin for them. Uh, and, you know, I'm not telling you to quit your jobs today like they did. But... You know, we got to understand that story because, you know, Jesus gave them purpose in their lives. And some of us can be guilty of spending too much time working. We can worship work. And, and it can get in the way of our relationship with God. I, I know there's times I should be starting my day with a devotion or something like that. And I'm, I'm jumping into work right away. And that's just not the best way to start your day. I mean, you're going to really feel like you're missing out on something. And uh, in James 1, uh, verse 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So this is something else that weighs us down, is trials. And trials uh, builds our steadfastness or endurance, which leads to hope, and growing in endurance and hope is like doing planks and push-ups in gym class every single day, even when you don't want to. Yeah. Uh, no, do you remember that back in high yeah, school? No, Did you like yeah. doing planks? I still don't like doing planks. Yeah. <laughs> no one should like doing planks. Yeah. It's an unnatural 
place for your body. That shouldn't happen. They're grueling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> push-ups are fine. We can do push-ups. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but the joy of the Lord is our strength. And trials develop our character, and character helps match competency when God opens doors for us. And regardless of the challenge before us, we must press forward knowing that God is going to be on our side and help us conquer anything and achieve anything. And, you know, it's not our own strength or our own endurance that will help us allow, that will allow us to cross the finish line. It's through Jesus, our champion of faith. You know, it's through Jesus we have endurance to say no to what the world does. It's through Jesus we have a strength to be a light to others, even when we're burned out and don't feel like doing anything anymore. And it's through Jesus who endured the cross, suffered for us so that our sins could be forgiven, so we could be free. Yeah, you're exactly right. If, if we're going to run that race, if we're going to be a Christian, if we're going to follow Christ, we need to drop everything that's holding us back. And so much of that stuff might not be sin. You know, it might just be a waste of time. You know, I am 100% guilty of wasting way too much time on my phone, right? Like, you, st you get on your phone at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you're like, oh, it's 8 o'clock at night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's I, a problem, I, I hope right? That's, like, a, that's a real problem. I hope that that's an over-exaggeration. That, that's a bit of an exaggeration, hopefully. <laughs> we'll just let it get, yeah, we'll just guess on that. But that's not necessarily wrong, right? You're not necessarily looking at anything wrong or doing anything wrong. But sitting in front of Netflix for 12 hours straight is probably just a waste of time, right? And that can hold you back from running the race, from achieving everything that the Lord wants you to achieve. When you are running the race, the other thing you have to think about is you basically have to follow the rules, right? You can't take any shortcuts, Right? When you're serving God, when you're serving the Lord, it's easy to start looking for shortcuts. Just little ways that might make your life easier. Right? Ignoring the word of God, going your own way, just because it's a little easier. Right? But we have to run the entire course in patience. Right? It's like running a race. If you're running a marathon and you're going for 20 miles and you see the road do that, you're like, well, you know, if I just like, cut across a couple people's yards like I'd cut off half a mile right you can't do that you're gonna be immediately disqualified that's not how it works right you got to run the entirety of the race we just read Hebrews 12 and 1 but I'm gonna come back to it and just look at the end of the verse here it says again therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely which we just talked about but then he says, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Yeah. That's set before us. We have to run our race, right? The race that God has set before us. Not the race that we think we should be running. Not somebody else's race. We have to run our own race, right? In 2 Timothy 2 and 5, um, Paul wrote to student Timothy, an athlete's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Right? We need to follow the rules. Right? We know that God has a plan for our lives. Or I believe that. I believe that God has a plan for all of our lives. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I believe that he has a purpose for us to fulfill within his kingdom. And each of us has a unique and a special purpose. Something that only we can do. And we know that our ultimate destination is to be with him forever. Right? Oftentimes, though, we can decide that the road from point A to point B is a little too windy, right? It's just a little too curvy. If I just cut off some of the corners, man, it would be so much easier, right? But if we do that, absolutely all of them end in destruction. And some of them are really obvious, like the shortcut of just ignoring parts of the Bible, ignoring biblical doctrine, right? You're just reading through the Bible and you're like, oh, I don't really like what that says. Just got to skip past that. Right? That's a shortcut. That's you attempting to make your life easier. That's me attempting to make my life easier just because it, the, ro the road that the Lord has set before me is a little too windy and it's a little inconvenient. Something that a lot of ministers run into, especially really, really young ministers, they're on fire for God, they go to Bible college, they feel this incredible calling on their life, and they're like, I know I'm going to preach before tens of thousands of people, and the, the whole continent of Asia or something is going to be won over to Christ because of me, and it's going to be incredible. And maybe the Lord does have that kind of calling on their life, but they're not willing to wait for it. 
And so what happens oftentimes is they start promoting themselves, right? They start calling around, hey, you should have me preach at all your services. And I'm a big deal, and I'm a great speaker, and you know I'm a great speaker. I'm going to do a great job. That's a shortcut. Yeah. That's not healthy, right? And it's easy to fall into all those kinds of traps, right? The Lord will promote you in his own time if you follow the race. One that I think we've all seen a lot, that sometimes happens to young people, is, hey, we all get lonely sometimes, right? Is that real? Do we get lonely sometimes? Yeah. And sometimes, man, I'd, I'd really like to have somebody in my life. Right? I'd like to have a young man or a young woman in my life and spend my life with. But sometimes we get in a hurry. Right? We're not willing to wait for a man or a woman of God who will challenge us and draw us closer to the Lord. And instead, you're like, man, that, that boy in math class is, like, super cute. <laughs> right? Man, that girl in English class, I think she was looking at me today. <laughs> right? That happens. Right? And if we pursue that, if we pursue that with a non-believer, if we pursue that for someone who isn't pursuing Christ, that's a shortcut, right? We're just in a hurry. Yeah, I'm and guilty of taking that shortcut a few times, John, and it didn't end well. It never ends well. Yeah. yeah. There's this ongoing joke every single time, and it seems to be happening recently. But every single time I find out, like, somebody's talking to somebody in the youth group or somebody's dating somebody, like, <laughs> the first question I always ask is, oh, that's really great. What church did they go to? And it's kind of a joke, right? But that is really the most important thing, yeah. right? That really is the most important thing. It genuinely is. Because you need someone in your life that can challenge you, that can draw you closer to the Lord, not pull you away. Not pull you away. Because that's just going to end in destruction. I need a couple of volunteers. Who wants to help me out? Colton, you already helped out. Who should I call on people? Who should I call on? Sonia, help me out. Love you, Sonia. Come on up here. Sonia! All right. So King David, you know who King David is, right? Yeah, okay. So King David was in a point in his life where he had the opportunity to take a shortcut once. Okay? He was being chased by King Saul. You're King Saul. Okay? Who are you? King Saul. Exactly. Okay. So King Saul was chasing David, okay, because King Saul was the king of Israel. He was the anointed king of Israel. And he knew David, David was anointed to be king after him, and he didn't want that to happen. And so he decided, I'm just going to kill David. And he hunted David like an animal, right? He did. He hunted him like an animal. And so one day, Saul was chasing David and chasing David. Saul, come on over. And Saul found a cave. He's like, oh, this is a nice cave. I think I'll go to sleep. You're going to sit down. I'm going to sleep. I'm sleep. Are you sleeping? Okay. King Saul's sleeping. Are you sleeping? I'm sleeping. Okay. Excellent. Okay. King Saul's sleeping. I need a David. Who wants to be my David? Ava, get on up here. Okay. You're King David. And you came into this cave, and you were surprised to find Saul. How surprised are you? Surprised. That's not that surprised. <laughs> That was not that surprised. <laughs> okay, let's try it again. Let's try it again. Let's go over here. Okay, okay. We're walking. We're walking. We're walking. There's Saul! Oh, that's better. Okay. <laughs> All right. And in this moment, David had a choice to make, right? David could have killed Saul. And we don't always really think about this, but no one else knew David was there. Only a few of his men knew David was there. He could have just murdered Saul disappeared, come back in a week, and, oh, I guess David's king now. He was the next anointed king. Everyone knew that. Right? That would have been a shortcut. What did David do? Do you know what David did? He didn't kill Saul. He didn't kill Saul. That's right. Okay, you can sit down. You can sit down. Thank you, Saul. We appreciate it. Hand. All right. David looked down at Saul, and in 1 Samuel 24 and 6, David said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the king, this person who's hunting him, the Lord's anointed, to put my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointed. David had enough fear of the Lord, 
right? He had enough strength to not take the shortcut, right? If we are going to run our race, we need to refuse to take the shortcuts and to trust in God's plan and in God's timing, right? We need to follow our own racetrack, our own individual racetrack in its entirety, all of it, right? We can't rush God. We can't ignore his word. Yeah, that's exactly right, John. We need to trust God's timing. We need to be humble in ministry. We need to be equally yoked in our relationships and not take those shortcuts. Yeah, that's really good. And when we run the race, we need to be running towards Jesus. We need to keep our eyes fixed and locked on him when we're running. And we're going to get closer and closer. And he needs to be the first priority in our lives. Hebrews 12, 2 continues, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. If we're running towards Jesus, we are becoming more like him. I mean, we're not perfect, and Jesus is perfect, but if we're running towards him, we, you know, we need to do that. And whether it's uh, money or accomplishments or entertainment or other people or running away from our fears, we need to, you know, be running towards Jesus. Because if we're not, if we're running away from God, we're running away from his will for our lives and what he wants for our lives. And Jacob is a great example of this. So Jacob's name means deceiver or supplanter. And, I mean, my name's Jacob, so I don't really like the meaning behind that name. But Bummer. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get to that later, how God changed his name. <laughs> so, from, from birth, Jacob deceived his brother Esau. And so, he stole Esau's birthright, and he stole Esau's blessing from his dad Isaac. And yet, Jacob feared Esau, so he ran away from home to his brother, I mean, to his uncle Laban. And so Laban actually turned this around on him and deceived Jacob and ended up having him uh, marry Laban's uh, daughter, Leah, instead of Rachel. And then he eventually married Leah as well. And Jacob amassed all this wealth. He had donkeys and servants. And this made Laban angry and, and a little jealous and, you know, and and upset, and so Jacob had to run away from home again. So Jacob continues this theme of running away from all of his fears. Yet Jacob fixed his eyes on the Lord. And finally, in Genesis 32, 26, Jacob met God face to face physically and grabbed a hold of the Lord and refused to let go. And so that's how desperate he was to have God close for him, close to him. God's blessing was an absolute priority in his life at that moment. He could have kept running away. He could have focused on the fear he had of his brother. He could have focused on the fear he had of his uncle Laban. Uh, but he realized in that moment that he couldn't run away from God anymore. He had to lock his eyes on the prize and never look away again. And when I was in high school, I was afraid of, you know, uh, and I was guilty of taking my eyes off Jesus. You know, I'd make things uh, that weren't Jesus a priority in my lives, like band, trying to be first chair playing trumpet, or sports, trying to, you know, make the varsity soccer team or baseball, uh, or relationships, as we talked about earlier, or even a job like, like you know, TJ Maxx, for example. <laughs> Just shooting for the stars there. Yeah, TJ Maxx, yeah. Got to start somewhere, yeah, John. Got to, yeah, I'm surprised you're not CEO, honestly. <laughs> Eyes on the prize, though, kids. Eyes on the prize. So the story of Jacob continues in Genesis 32, 28. Uh, in the ESV, God said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And so striven is defined as make great efforts to achieve or obtain something, struggle or fight victoriously. And prosper in Hebrew means to push forward. And so that's exactly what Jacob did in this moment. He pushed forward in the right direction this time, and he prevailed, and he obtained God in his life. 
And so I've wrestled with God in the past. You know, uh, I've let him change my thoughts, though, in the process. I've let him change my name and break the chains and addictions that were on my life and set me free. And I've let him change my name like, just like he did for Jacob. And Isaiah 56, 5 says, I will give them within the walls of my house a memorial and a name far greater than sons and daughters could give. For the name I give them is an everlasting one. It will never disappear. Yeah, praise, praise the Lord. And, and Jacob was blessed with a new name, an everlasting one, one for eternity. And as God promised in Genesis 28, 14 to Jacob, all people on earth were blessed through Jacob and his offsprings. And who were among his offspring? Jesus, our Messiah, from the genealogy of David and Jacob. And, you know, Jesus is the name above every other name. He's given us a new name. He's given all of us, everyone here, a new name, an everlasting one, if we believe in him and follow him and run to him. And, you know, Jacob fought against God his whole life. He was a deceiver. He was a trickster. He was selfish. And he'd always done things his own way. I know we're all guilty of doing that. You know, we want to just take things into our own hand. We want to do it our own way. And it was up until that moment that he came face to face with God. He grabbed a hold of him and he wrestled with him. And he, you know, he saw God and refused to let go of God. And, you know, he refused to run in any direction but towards the only one that could save him. Yeah, and Jesus is the only one that can save. That's why we got to keep our eyes locked on him, right? It's like when you're running a race. If you're looking way over there, you're not looking at the finish line. That's the direction you're going to go, right? If you don't keep your eyes locked on Jesus the entire time, you're going to go astray. You're going to go astray. Racing, it turns out, is hard work. It turns out it's really hard work that we have to fight for every single step. And being a Christian is hard work. It is. It's hard work, right? We need to fight for every single step forward, right? I think of the Apostle Paul, right? The Apostle Paul ran this race most of his adult life, decades. And I love the Apostle Paul because he's arguably one of the greatest Christians who have ever lived, right? Easily one of the greatest evangelists and missionaries of all time, right? But you look at what he went through. You look at all the struggles and the fights he went through. He fought for every step forward, right? He was stoned, right? I don't think anyone here can say that. No one's ever come up to me with rocks in their hands and tried to bash my head in, right? right? That happened to him. He was beaten. He was mocked. People made fun of him. He was imprisoned more than once. He was shipwrecked. And one thing that just blows my mind, I don't know if it blows anyone else's mind, but it blows my mind, the Apostle Paul is this incredible Christian, right? One of the most incredible Christians I've ever lived. If anyone, anywhere, deserved to do nothing with their life, but commit it entirely to ministry, just preach, teach, write for their entire lives. He was the Apostle Paul, right? But the Apostle Paul had a job. He did. From time to time, he made tents. Isn't that crazy? Like, the Apostle Paul made tents to support himself. Yeah. Like, that's a sacrifice. That's a struggle. He could have said, I'm above that. But he didn't. He worked. That's incredible. That's a sacrifice, right? That's working and striving for every single step forward because it matters. Mm -hmm. And finally, the Apostle Paul was beheaded. He was killed for preaching Jesus. And at the very end of his life, he wrote a letter to his, his child in Christ, his student, Timothy, and one of the very last things, or pretty close to one of the last things that he wrote in his life, was in 2 Timothy 4 and 7. And this is how he described his own race. He said, I have fought the good fight. I kept fighting. I never stopped. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
He yeah. fought for decades. He and did. when he looked back at the end of his life, he knew he was going to about to be killed. And he looked back and he knew, I made it. Yeah. Right. I finished strong. Yeah. Oh. Every single day, we need to get up and we need to run our race. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be a lot of work. And we're going to mess up a lot. Right? Yep. It's going to happen. We're going we're gonna to fall down a lot. Mm -hmm. right? But when you're running a marathon, if you trip over a shoelace, you don't just like lie on the ground and go, oh, no, my shoe's untied, and then like cry until like someone comes and picks you up. Like, that's crazy. Who would do that? Right? No, you tie your shoe and you keep running. Yeah, you get right? back that, up. You get back up. Yeah. Yeah, you get back up and keep running. And that's exactly how it is in serving Christ. You're going to mess up. You're going to fall. You're going to do something that you, you disappoint yourself in. Mm -hmm. The trick is to keep getting back up and yep. to keep on running. Amen. And so, when you're at lunch, and that person sits next to you and says, hey, you want the answers to the history test? We know that never happens in the lunchroom, but let's pretend that somehow <laughs> students get a hold of answer keys. It happens a lot. If you wouldn't know that, yeah, Tur Turns out no. that doesn't help you learn, John. Yeah, it doesn't help you learn. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't help you learn. And learning's the most important thing, Jake. Thank you. But in that moment, you have a choice to make, right? You can say, yeah, I'd like an easy A. Or you can do the honest thing, which is the more difficult thing, and say, no, I don't want to look at that. I don't want to look at that because I want to keep running the race. Yeah. And that's what's important, and that's what matters to me. That's what matters to me. When your sibling makes you so mad, you just murder them. Right. My brother and I never yeah. made each other mad. Yeah, me either. Yeah, my brother and I were just silent all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I could still hear the echoes. John, get out of my room. I'm not in your room. I'm in the doorway. It's different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When they get so mad, you can just murder them. Right? You got to keep running the race. Right? Throw off that anger. Throw off that wrath. And it's hard, right? When you're at school, the popular kids start making fun of you for how you dress or how you talk or how you act or the things you do or the things you refuse to do. Right. You just got to keep running the race. You just got to keep on running. Just keep on running. Every day, a new commitment. We're just going to keep on running. When you're the only one in your family that's living for God, I know that's hard. Keep on running because it's worth it. It's so worth it. I promise you, it's worth it. Just keep on running. We're going to get really real and a little awkward here. Is that okay? <laughs> Thanks, Golden. It's okay. Let's make it a little awkward. When that attractive young boy or girl starts texting you and starts asking for pictures of you, and I don't think I need to say anything more than that. We know what I'm talking about. You need to keep running the race. Right. You need to text that person back immediately and say, I don't do that. Right. Oh, and by the way, we're not talking anymore. Yeah. Yeah, you need to kick that person to the curb. Yeah. Oh. And I know that's hard. That's hard. But I'm telling you, it doesn't matter if you've been talking to that person for a month or you've been talking to that person for five years. That person clearly has a whole lot of demons they're wrestling with, and they need victory over that before they're in any position to talk to you. Okay? Yep. You need to keep running the race. Because they're clearly not running. You need to keep going forward. You need to keep going forward. When you're on your phone and some unhealthy pictures pop up, 
you need to close all your apps and put that phone away. Get that out of there. Yeah. That stuff will poison your mind. It will rot your soul. It will steal your salvation. And we have more important things to worry about. Put that away. Keep running the race every single day. Every single day, you need to commit to yourself that, you know what, it's not easy. It's not popular, it's not cool, it's exhausting. Sometimes it doesn't even seem like it's worth all the trouble. But, but I know what's right. I know what God demands of me, and I know what's wrong. And I'm just going to keep on running every single day, because it's worth it. Because yeah. it's worth it. And, you know, one of the most beautiful things about running the race is that, yeah, it's a lot of work, but we're not running alone. Right, right. It's not just you. Every single day, every step you take, Jesus is right there next to you. Yes. Every single day. In the book of Matthew... Right at the end of Matthew, the very last sentence in the entire book, Matthew 28, 20, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's about to ascend into heaven. And the very last thing that he says to his disciples is, behold, I am with you always yes. to the end of the age. I am with you always. Jesus promised that he would never leave us alone. We would never have to run this race alone. Yeah, running the race is hard. It's difficult. We're going to go through periods in our life in which we're just going to have to fight for every single step, and we're going to trip, and we're going to have to get back up, and then we're going to trip again, and we're just going to have to keep going. Mm -hmm. But Jesus promised that if we just keep running, if we just keep going, that we will never have to run alone. Because everywhere we go, we carry the Holy Ghost with us. We carry his spirit within us. Jesus promised in John 14 that even though his physical body was going to leave this earth, that his spirit would return to live in us, to comfort us, to strengthen us, to help us every step of the way. In John 14, 16 through 18, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. He's talking to his disciples right now. You know him, for he dwells with you. Who is he talking about? He's talking about himself. You know this Spirit because he dwells with you right now. He's right in front of you. But he will be in you. Yes. He will be in you. And on the day of Pentecost, that spirit, the spirit of Christ, descended on the church and was in us for the first time. Yes. And as hard as running the race can seem, when the Holy Ghost is active in our lives, Jesus is with us every single step. Because I can't do it, right? I can't possibly run the race in my own strength. That's not possible, right? I can't push off every temptation. I can't fight off everything that comes my way. But through his spirit, through the help of Christ, through the help of God in us, I can, right? I can overcome and I can keep moving forward and keep taking every single step. And I can follow that race all the way to the end. All the way to the end. Yeah. Yeah, and running the race isn't easy. It's completely worth it. I mean, as you said, you know, we have lots of trials. We'll fall down. We're going to need to get back up. And we're going to need to get up again and again and again. But we have Jesus by our side to get us through that. And if we run the race, if we drop those weights, if we don't take shortcuts, 
if we keep our eyes locked on Jesus and if we, you know, fight every single day all the way to the finish with God on our side, then we're going to be able to run that race and get that trophy at the end. And 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So we're not racing for a wreath. We're not racing for a trophy in the Christian race. We're racing, you know, for eternity, eternal, eternal life with Jesus. And, yeah, I mean, so it, it's, it's really, that's the whole point. That's the yeah. whole point. Yeah. We're not racing for something silly, right? We're not racing for a headband, right? And I know the headbands are super silly. And if you didn't get one, I have a box of them. Grab one before you go. But I hope that it just serves as this really silly kind of quirky reminder of, you know what? Every day I got to keep running. Yeah. Like I just can't give up. I just can't give up. Every day is a new day. And I just got to keep running. And in the end, if you do keep running every single day, man, it's worth it. It is. It's so, it's so worth it. I can't even put into words or into my notes how worth it it is. Yeah. Living for the Lord Jesus is the best decision I ever made ever yeah. in my entire life. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've never regretted it one moment. I've never heard anyone yeah. say that they regret it. No, I have never talked to anyone who's, you know, in their 80s or 90s, and they've been living for God for decades, and they tell me, you know, I wish I hadn't done this whole Christian thing. It was a lot of work. <laughs> There's so many services, I could have been watching football. Like, no one says that, right? Because it is worth it. It's a beautiful yeah. life living for Jesus. Yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful life. And it doesn't stop here because at the end of the finish line, we get to be with him forever. Yes. Right? We get to be with him forever. Right? And my hope and what I'm striving for and what I think absolutely all of us need to strive for is that when we do get there, when we do get to the end of our lives, when we do get to the end of the racetrack and we cross the finish line, Jesus is standing there and he's going to look back across our lives. He's going to look back at every day. And I want him to look at every single one of us yes. and to say exactly what that master said to his servant in Matthew 25, 21. His master said to him, well done. Yes. Well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Let's all stand. Today we have an opportunity to make a new commitment to the Lord. Maybe some of us have been running the race for a really long time. Years, decades. It's okay to stop right now and recommit. I'm going to keep running today, and I'm going to keep running tomorrow, and I'm going to keep running the next day. Maybe you've never made a commitment like that. Today's the day. Today's the day. Because it's a beautiful life living for Jesus. It's worth every single step, I promise you. It really is. It really is. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask all of the young people... Come on, stand up here. All the young people, come on, stand up here. And we're going to take a few minutes. We're going to make a new commitment. Come on, guys, come on. I'm not going to call names. I can see you. Come on up. Come on up. Okay. We're going to make a new commitment. And nobody's going to, nobody's going to try and 
bash Jesus into your head because that's not how it works. This is a personal decision. This is a personal commitment that you make, right? But if you're ready to make that commitment, then you can make it right now. You can make it right now. All right, church, let's come in behind these young people. Come on in. Let's come in behind these young people. This is a youth service, I know, but let's support our young people. And everyone that's here, everyone that's here has the opportunity to make that new commitment. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to close our eyes and we're going to raise our hands. Everyone who's comfortable. No one's going to force you. No one's looking. It doesn't matter. If you're comfortable, raise your hands. And we're going to make a new commitment to running the race. You can say what I say, or you can say it in your own way and in your own words. Lord Jesus, my Lord, my God, today I make a new commitment to you that I'm going to follow you, that I'm going to run the race, that I'm going to run the race in its entirety, that I'm not going to give up, that I'm not going to take any shortcuts, that I'm not going to turn aside or turn away. I'm going to keep my eyes locked right on you the entire time, and I'm just going to keep running closer and closer and closer to you and becoming more like you every single day, every single day. If it's been a while since you repented, let's repent together right now. If you've never repented, you can repent right now. All that means is that you're going before the Lord and you're saying, I'm sorry. I've messed up in the past. But you know what? I don't want to mess up anymore. And I'm making a commitment that from now on, from now on, I'm going to put in every effort that I'm not going to go the wrong direction anymore. Lord Jesus, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for anything I've done in the past that has disappointed you. Anything that's gone against your word. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for that sin in my life, that sin that separates me from you. Get it out of the way. Cleanse my heart, I pray, Jesus. I repent. I turn from that sin forever. I don't want to turn to that sin anymore. I want to get away from it. I want to get it out of my life. I want to go towards you every day. Let's raise our hands. Let's worship the King of Kings the Lord of Lords, the God of Gods. Lord Jesus, I love you, I worship you, I magnify you. You are my God, you are my Lord, and you are my King. Jesus, I love you.